Have you ever wondered how much you should weigh? We're talking for health purposes here. You can choose to weigh whatever you want. In the last video, we discussed the BMI and why in isolation it isn't a great metric to determine what your weight should be. So what should you use instead? That is what we are going to explore in this video. It turns out that ideal body weight is actually a thing. There have been several formulas over the years that have attempted to identify one's ideal body weight based on their height and gender. If you go to the website listed on my right, you can see what your ideal body weight is for yourself. For fun, I've plotted these four formulas using standard units for men and women. In general, the ideal body weights fall within a BMI range of 22 to 24 for men and 20 to 22 for women. However, we already discussed the BMI in detail and learned why it is not a great guide for individual health. It turns out that these ideal body weight formulas were based on much of the same underlying data that the initial BMI thresholds were derived from. While BMI thresholds were refined over time as more data was collected, the ideal body weight formulas were not. For this reason, they should be expected to perform worse than the BMI, not better. Your height and weight alone are just simply not good enough to evaluate your health. We're going to need to take things a step further and also consider body composition. Your body's total weight can be broken down into different components. In a two compartment model, we can divide the body into lean body mass and body fat. We can split the lean body mass into additional components such as water, bone, and other organs to generate more detailed models that contain more compartments. There are several tools available to attempt to determine what your individual body composition is when considering these different models. However, these can be expensive and hard to find. Ideally, we could approximate these more complex analyses with simpler methods. Two recent studies evaluated this, attempting to determine how accurately we can assess body fat percentage with relatively simple measures such as height, weight, BMI, waist circumference, neck circumference, and even skinfold measurements. Skinfold measurements are checked with calipers, and while higher quality ones are expensive, cheaper ones are available. In both studies, the authors compared various equations created from these simpler measurements to a five compartment model that was generated with some combination of several of the more expensive tools shown earlier. So how did these equations do? Some of them performed quite well, generating average body fat percentage values within 1% of the five compartment confirmed level. However, when looking at individuals, it is a different story, with greater than 20% of individuals in every tested equation being off by greater than 5%, and that can be in either direction. For example, if your actual body fat percentage is 25%, then there is at least a 20% chance that the equations will tell you your body fat percentage is less than or equal to 20%, or greater than or equal to 30%. Additionally, the 95% confidence interval spanned at least 17% for each equation, as it is commonly stated that the body fat percentage thresholds for obesity are in the 25-35% to 35 range depending on sex, clearly only being able to estimate your body fat percentage confidently to within roughly 10% accuracy is not ideal. What this means is that while we know a main flaw of using the BMI is that it doesn't account for body composition, there is also no simple method to determine your body composition accurately. Thus, we need a different approach. Even if we could analyze our body composition accurately, this doesn't address the fact that two individuals with the same body composition may carry different types of body fat or carry it in different locations, both of which could lead to different health outcomes. Many studies have considered the impact of body fat distribution and we'll go through this here. One review included 66 studies and assessed a wide variety of different anthropometric measurements to determine how they correlate with various measures of health. You can see in the table some of the measurements they included just to give you an idea of the wide variety of metrics that have been considered. The paper is freely available if you want to see things in more detail. Importantly, while many different metrics have been examined, most of them have only been evaluated in relatively few studies while looking at only a small number of health outcomes. These limitations were also noted in a separate review on the same topic. Until more evidence is gathered, I don't recommend relying on any of these specific metrics to evaluate your overall health. However, some measurements do have larger bodies of evidence, and these generally incorporate your waist circumference in some fashion. One systematic review and meta-analysis included 72 prospective cohort studies and assessed the association of measures of central fatness with all-cause mortality. Let's look at what they found. This first figure shows that on average, for every 10 centimeter increase in waist circumference, the risk of death increases by 
When adjusting for BMI, this actually increases to 17%, likely because after adjusting for BMI, the waist circumference better indicates the more harmful visceral fat within the abdomen. This has also been seen in other data where more harmful effects are seen at higher waist circumference thresholds in people who have higher BMIs. We'll get back to this point later in this video. The waist circumference association differs between women and men, where in women, the risk starts to increase after 80 centimeters or so while in men the risk begins to increase between 90 to 100 centimeters, depending on whether you adjust for the BMI. In these plots, each circle corresponds to a different study estimate, the size of the circle indicates the precision of the estimate, the solid line represents the nonlinear dose response, and the dotted lines represent the 95% confidence intervals. When looking at hip circumference, the data indicates that a larger hip circumference in isolation is beneficial to a point, but then becomes harmful. However, when adjusting for the waist circumference and BMI, a larger hip circumference is always protective. This may be due to the hip circumference indicating greater muscle mass or perhaps a beneficial role of gluteal fat. Regardless, given the dependence on waist circumference and BMI to interpret this properly, it makes less sense to look at the hip circumference alone. To account for this, the authors also look at the waist to hip circumference ratio, where you measure your waist circumference and divide it by your hip circumference. For every 0.1 unit increase in this ratio, the risk of mortality increases by 20%, and when adjusting by BMI, this increases to 26%. Looking at the sex-specific plots, these numbers tend to increase from around 0.75 in women and around 0.90 in men. When looking at the ratio of the waist circumference to the height, every 0.1 unit increase associates with a 24% increased risk of mortality, and when adjusting for BMI, this increases to 42%. When looking at specific plots, the waist to height threshold where risk begins to increase varies somewhat based on which subset of people you are looking at, but in general, the risk begins to increase more significantly once it reaches around 0.5. This is particularly evident when looking at the plot of healthy participants, which includes individuals who did not have cancer or cardiovascular disease at baseline. The numbers shown previously correspond to specific units of increment and are summarized in the table on the screen. The waist to height ratio has the largest hazard ratio and thus seems to be the most informative regarding risk of harm. Importantly, all of the relationships that were able to be adjusted for BMI were strengthened when doing so. We'll get back to this point later. When looking at the data slightly differently, using increments based on standard deviations, the results are similar, with one exception. In this case, it appears that the waist to thigh ratio may be the most informative, but importantly, this was only considered in two studies and the confidence interval is quite wide. We need more data to evaluate this specific measurement. At this point, from this large review, it seems that the waist to height ratio is the best metric to use for prognostic purposes regarding mortality. I will add one caveat, which is that the data was generally weaker when looking at individuals aged 60 and older. This is likely due to the obesity paradox that we touched on in the last video, where the higher lean body mass associated with a higher BMI can exert a protective effect. The prior data was all regarding mortality. A similar analysis of 31 studies looked at cardiovascular disease as an outcome instead of mortality. The authors here also found a stronger association with the waist to height ratio than either waist circumference or waist to hip ratio, with a sharp increase in risk once the ratio surpasses 0.5. Thus, this further supports that the waist to height ratio may be the best metric to use for prognostic purposes, with 0.5 being a key threshold to keep in mind. Of course, using your waist to height ratio is only helpful if you know how to measure your waist circumference. Several different strategies have been evaluated in the literature, and a recent study compared many of these. The authors were specifically trying to determine which methods best approximate the total amount of visceral adipose tissue, which is the more metabolically harmful fat around the inner abdominal organs. They found the best measurements were at the narrowest portion of the waist, the minimum waist circumference if there was no well-defined narrowest portion, and also at the lower border of the bottom rib. However, the two methods most widely used in the literature are different from any of these three. The World Health Organization recommends using the midpoint between the lower rib and the iliac crest, while the National Institutes of Health recommends using the upper border of the iliac crest. Studies generally find these yield fairly similar results in men, while there may be greater variability in women. As an aside, many of these studies also show that individuals typically underestimate their own waist circumference by 1 to 3 centimeters, with a larger degree of error in people with a larger waist circumference. So there are several options, but which should you use? Most of the studies evaluating the waist to height ratio use one of the latter two measurements. Using the midpoint between the lower rib and the iliac crest would better approximate the potentially more informative measurements I just mentioned earlier but using the upper border of the iliac crest may be easier to reproduce with repeat measurements over time.
If you are going to track how your waist circumference changes over time, then reproducibility is key, and we'll discuss that further in a future video. For a one-time measurement to determine what your waist to height ratio is, I think either of these two more popular methods is fine to use. When you actually measure your waist circumference, you should stand tall, do not suck your stomach in, stand in front of a mirror so you can make sure that the tape is horizontal and not angled in any way, and measure at the end of a normal expiration, which is when you breathe out. Repeat this twice and then take an average of the three measurements, and then you can feel fairly confident that you have an accurate waist circumference for yourself. Let's quickly summarize what we have discussed and then pull all the pieces of the puzzle together. Using your BMI alone is a flawed approach, and we cannot easily assess body composition. Of the various anthropometric measurements that have been evaluated, using your waist to height ratio seems to be the best indicator of future health. However, the predictive power of the waist to height ratio was strengthened when adjusting it for the BMI. This is likely because this adjustment actually provides information about your underlying body composition without directly measuring your body fat percentage. To picture this, imagine two people with the same height and waist circumference, but who weigh different amounts. The person who weighs more will generally have more lean body mass, but a similar amount of the more harmful visceral adipose tissue. This additional lean body mass can exert a protective effect against all-cause mortality, and the exercise or physical activity one will perform to acquire higher amounts of lean body mass will have several health benefits as well. Thus, the BMI in isolation may not be very helpful, but in conjunction with your waist to height ratio, it can be much more informative. So getting back to the main topic of this video, how much should you weigh? Based on all that we have discussed, I don't believe there is a single answer to this question. What makes the most sense to me is to practice healthy eating and exercising habits to get your waist to height ratio below 0.5, and from there to gradually engage in resistance training while eating in a caloric surplus to build additional lean body mass. This way you can obtain the beneficial effects of extra muscle and lean body mass while avoiding the harmful effects of excessive body fat. The key here is that if your waist to height ratio is greater than 0.5, it may be time to lose some weight, while if it is less than 0.5, you will be in a better position to healthily work on building muscle if you choose to do so. And with that, I thank you all for your attention, and if you like this content, then consider subscribing for future videos. Goodbye.